Welcome to another Bits of Q episode on the Solid Principles. Today we are going to look at the second of the Solid Principles, the Open Close Principle. While the idea behind this principle is easy to understand, it is perhaps one of the hardest principles to apply correctly in practice. The Open Close Principle states that software entities, that is classes, modules, components, even whole systems, should be open for extension, but at the same time closed for modification. So what does this mean? It means that you should be able to easily extend your class, adding new functionality, but you should be able to do so without having to modify that class. The reason for this is simple. If you have to modify existing code in order to extend it, there's a chance that you might accidentally modify something you didn't intend to, and hence cause a bug. On the other hand, if you can extend your code freely without having to touch existing code, then the odds of actually introducing a bug with this extension are a lot less. Sounds like a good idea, right? We simply write our code so we can extend it without modifying the original. But how do you do this? And do the techniques used to do this at a class level differ from the ones used at a system level? That's what we are going to look at today. How to successfully apply the open close principle all the way from the class level to the high level architecture of a whole system. We will start simple by looking at the design of a single class and its interactions. In this example, we are going to write some software to help a company keep track of its employees. The main requirements are coming from the HR department. They basically have three. They want to hire managers, they want to hire engineers, and lastly, both these managers and engineers need to sign a contract before they can get hired. So we come up with the following design. We have the HR department class, which takes care of the hiring, and keeping into account good object-oriented programming practices, we create separate classes, one representing the engineer and one representing the manager. The hire functions in the HR department class will simply accept an instance of either engineer or manager, invoke the sign contract function on them, and then add this manager or engineer to the appropriate list. If you've paid good attention to the previous episode where we discussed the single responsibility principle, you might already get a bit suspicious about this HR department class. Because if this class is storing its engineers and its managers, then it makes sense that there's also some requirement about retrieving them again. And indeed, if we talk to the customer a bit more, we find out that the HR department also has a requirement to generate reports that include the list of employees. Now, looking at these four requirements, they all come from the HR department. But if you think about it, it makes sense that the requirement about generating reports will probably change for different reasons than the hiring policies. So, Looking at the single responsibility principle, we should consider this a separate actor. And then we are faced with the fact that in the current design, the HR department class serves two different actors. It is responsible to two different actors. Hence, it violates the single responsibility principle. A better design would probably be to take out the data, the list of engineers and managers, and have the logic of the hiring be contained in the HR department class. We could then add a second class that contains all the logic related to creating reports. But of course, we were going to talk about the open close principle, not about the single responsibility principle. And to keep this example as simple as possible, we'll just forget about that for now and go back to our original design, where all the requirements coming from the HR department, even though they are actually different actors, are just stored in one class. Regardless of the design we look at, though, both this version and the one with separate classes violates the open close principle. Why is this? Well, imagine what would happen if you got another requirement about hiring assistants. In order to add this functionality to the existing HR department class, you would have to modify it. You'd have to add another hire function and we'd have to add a third list. And of course, every time you modify a class, there's a risk that you might accidentally modify something that you didn't want to modify and hence introduce a bug. So how could we change this design? How could we make the HR department class open for extension while at the same time keeping it closed for modification? Let's start by identifying the source of the problem. In the current design, we need to modify the HR department class because its higher functionality depends on concrete implementations. We have a higher function for every type of employee, which if you think about it, doesn't really make a lot of sense because every employee is treated the same way. Every employee has to sign a contract and then they're added to a list. 
to solve our violation of the open close principle, we are going to do the opposite. Instead of tying ourselves to concrete classes, we are going to introduce an interface that abstracts away the different employee types. I've marked the employee interface with a little if label at the top of it to indicate that this is an interface. You can think of an interface as a contract. An interface describes a certain kind of behavior, in this case, the ability of employees to sign a contract, but it doesn't provide any actual implementation to do so. If a class, like the engineer or manager class, wants to implement an interface, then this means that it should provide all the functionality that's described in the interface. It should provide the concrete implementation needed for the sign contract function. Since every implementation of an interface is guaranteed to provide the function it describes, we can now write the higher function in terms of that interface without having to care about whether this interface is actually implemented by a manager, an engineer, or an assistant. As a result, the implementation of the HR department class no longer depends on the specific roles, which means that if we now want to extend this class, we simply add a new role, make sure it implements this same employee interface, and then we're done. We don't have to touch the HR department class anymore. In other words, the HR department class can still be extended, we can just add new roles, but it's close for modification. We don't need to modify this class itself to make such an extension. Now, before we look at the open close principle at a higher system level, I first want to make a remark about interfaces in different languages. Interfaces are explicitly supported in all the big object-oriented languages that are statically typed. Examples include Java, C Sharp, C++. In these languages, we explicitly define the interface and the concrete class, and this concrete class then inherits from this interface. So implementing an interface happens through inheritance. In these diagrams, I use the closed arrowhead to indicate an implements relationship. For a normal using relationship, I use the open arrowhead. When we look at dynamically typed languages, such as Ruby, Python, JavaScript, then we often see that either they just don't support explicit interfaces, or if they do, they at least extend this functionality by also supporting duck typing. The idea behind duck typing is simple. If it walks and quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. Translated to software, if two instances of an object offer the same function, then for the purposes of interaction with this function, these instances can be considered the same type. In other words, if both an engineer and a manager instance offer the same signed contract function, then these can be treated as the same type. You could say that duck typing implicitly generates interfaces as needed. So in a dynamically typed language that supports duck typing, you can actually abide by the open close principle without having to create explicit interfaces. Okay, so we just talked about applying the open close principle to a single class. And this is where most tutorials on YouTube end. However, if you want to scale up your system, you have to think bigger than just classes. That's why I think it's important to also learn about the open close principle in the context of modules and even components. We haven't talked about components yet. Let me start by defining what I mean when I say the word component. And I'll stick to the definition of the clean architecture book here. A software system consists of one or more components that are deployed independently. The method of deployment depends on the language and platform. For example, if you're writing a Java application, then you are deploying your components as jar files. But if you are writing a .NET application in C Sharp, you might use DLL files, dynamically linked libraries. Similarly, if you're writing a C++ application for a Unix system, you'll probably use .so files for your shared libraries. Of course, the most well-known way of deploying is an executable, the famous .exe files in Windows. Regardless of the language and method of deployment you choose, a software system consists of one or more components that are deployed and can be developed independently. Each of these components consists of one or more modules, and each module consists of one or more classes, data structures, interfaces, functions, etc. The open close principle can be applied to all layers of software development. Let's have a look at applying the open close principle at a component level. We will do this with a slightly more complex example. We are going to make an application for stock market analysis. Sounds pretty cool, right? This example is a slight variation on an example from the Clean Architecture book, which the author was kind enough to give me permission to use in this series. The high-level pitch is as follows. The system gets the data from the stock exchange. It then runs some market analysis algorithms on this data, on the different price changes. 
results of this analysis should be shown on a web page, as well as be printable to a PDF format. If we apply the single responsibility principle, we might come up with a data flow diagram like this one. The key insight here is that generating the report involves two separate responsibilities, the calculation of the reported data and the presentation of the data in a PDF or web-friendly format. The next step would be to organize the code dependencies to make sure that changes in one of these responsibilities do not impact any of the other responsibilities, and that, in line with the open-close principle, we can extend the behavior without having to make any modifications. As you can imagine, there's probably a ton of classes involved in a system like this. Luckily, we already looked at the open-close principle at the class level, so we can now abstract from this level of detail and instead look at a high-level diagram showing the different components in the system. We come up with the following component diagram. Here, an arrow between two components shows a code dependency, meaning that if a component A has an arrow pointing towards component B, there's at least some class in A that mentions the name of a class in B. For example, one or more classes in the WebView component mentions the name of one of the classes in the Screen Presenter component. Hence, there's a source code dependency from WebView to Screen Presenter. If we look up here, we see that the component that encapsulates the stock market database actually depends on the market analysis algorithms. There's an arrow going from the stock market database to market analysis. This might seem a bit strange, because if you remember the data flow diagram, the market analysis algorithms actually use data from the stock market database. Yet the arrow is pointing the other way. This is not a mistake. We designed the dependency to be in this direction on purpose. The reason for this is simple. If a component A depends on a component B, meaning there's a source code relation from A to B, an arrow from A to B, then any change in B might impact component A, whereas changes in A will not impact component B. In this high-level design, we made sure that the arrow was pointing from the stock market database to the market analysis algorithms because we don't want changes in the stock market database to impact the market analysis algorithms. If we decide that we want to gather our data from different stock exchanges, for example, this should not change any of the market analysis algorithms. Similarly, if we want to add a new way of presenting our data, maybe we want to create a mobile-friendly view, then this again should not impact our market analysis algorithms. Indeed, we designed the system such that all dependencies are towards the market analysis component, meaning that this market analysis component is protected against change. It is closed for modification. We can extend the system, we can add new stock market databases, we can add new views, but the market analysis component is closed for modification. So why did we decide to make this market analysis component so special? Why is it in such a privileged position? The reason for this is that the market analysis component deals with the central concern. It contains the highest level policies whereas all other components are dealing with peripheral concerns. And hence, that's the component we want to keep close for modification and protect against changes in the rest of the system. So by drawing a component diagram, you can already start reasoning about the dependencies in the system and about the application of the open-close principle at an architecture level, without having to dive into the separate classes and interfaces. Now let's zoom in a bit on the stock market database and market analysis components to show you how we can design their interaction such that the dependency indeed goes from database to analysis. I'm only showing the classes and modules here that are of interest for this interaction. The first thing to note is that all the arrows going across the component boundary are pointing from database to market analysis. This is why the dependency arrow was drawn from database to analysis in the component diagram. To make sure that the dependencies all point towards the analysis component, we made sure that the Two components talk in the same language. They both use classes and interfaces from the financial entities module that's defined in the market analysis component. I just drew the financial entities module as a rectangle here to show that it's not a single class but instead a module. On the database side we introduced the data mapper class that's responsible for translating the internal representation of the stock exchange to financial entities. This mapper inherits from an interface, the data gateway interface, defined in the market analysis component. This allows market analysis to retrieve its data by talking to its own interface, the gateway interface. And hence, it does not need to have a dependency on the concrete classes in the stock market database component. 
and now for a pretty cool side effect. In our desire to protect the market analysis component from changes, we introduced a couple of interfaces to invert the data dependency. After all, the market analysis component uses data from the stock market database, yet the dependency is now pointing in the other direction. As such, we have unknowingly applied the dependency inversion principle, the fifth of the solid principles. This goes to show that all these different principles work together to point us in the same direction when it comes to good software design. We will talk more about the dependency inversion principle in a later episode. To summarize, the open close principle says that software entities should be open to extension, but we should be able to make these extensions without having to modify the entities themselves. They should be closed for modification. At the class level, we can achieve this by making sure we depend on abstract interfaces and not on concrete implementations. If we take the bird's eye view of a big system, we can look at the dependencies in the component diagram to determine where modifications would impact other components and hence might cause changes. At the system level, we want to make sure that the component that contains our business rules, the core high-level policies of our system, is protected against change by making sure that the dependencies all point towards the central component. In the next episode, we are going to dig into the third of the solid principles, the Liskov substitution principle. This principle lies at the heart of object-oriented design and helps guide us into proper use of inheritance. And just like the open-close principle, the Liskov substitution principle can also be applied at a system level. But that's something for the next episode. So leave a like, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you next time.